I really hope that you enjoyed Of Mice and Men. It was the, the first book that I read that was like an adult book. Um, and it was just sort of on accident that I read it when I was in the seventh grade. And it was way too old for me. And I didn't really... Anyway, I talked about that some, I know, uh, in my writing. Um, what I want to talk about is the power behind this book. Um, because I do think that it's um, still probably rings with a lot of power. That if you didn't feel that, you might want to read it again. Because um, both characters of, of George and Lenny are, are really humanized um, throughout the entire book. Um, just for example, you know, like I said that George is sort of the everyman character. He, he really, <clears throat> when he talks about his backstory with, with uh, Lenny, who he's not related to, who he has no real investment in besides some abstract promise to an abstract person, um, he, ultimately he cares about Lenny and, and he needs Lenny and he needs Lenny's dream to move him forward. But it's also that, that scene where he tricks Lenny into jumping into the river and he um, uh, has to save him that really humanizes George because we've all been there. Um, we've all been that person who has made fun of someone and realized just how screwed up that was. Um, we've all been that person who's, who's had some, some form of ignorance and um, has been, uh, you know, vi victim to our own miseducation on things and looked back with embarrassment about the way we've acted. Um, and that really humanizes George to me. That really makes George um, better than a sort of perfect person, better than a person who, who's just good at heart or um, saintly or something like that. Um, we never see him be saintly. Um, we, we, we always see him be um, very, very human, full of human flaws and human passions and, and, and human desires. And the one sort of saintly part about him is, is intrinsically linked with um, this dream that he shares with, uh, with Lenny, this dream about the farm and the rabbits and all of that. And uh, when he loses Lenny, um, he, he loses that, that saintliness, I think, as we go on. Um, but when we talk about literature, and, and so often um, people wonder why we have to write and read about these super important topics all the time. Um, we don't, obviously. Um, there's tons and tons and tons of books that you can read that are completely hedonic, that are, that, that are just complete, you know, hedonism, um, uh, just entertaining or fun or something like that. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's, it's fun to read fun stuff. But when we really sit and contemplate great literature, often it is about some, something important. Um, something like uh, what, what America was going through during the Depression, something about um, the role of workers in a society that clearly doesn't appreciate workers, um, the role of women in a society that clearly doesn't appreciate women, the role of um, uh, minorities that is perfectly willing to, to cripple um, uh, the minority and use their, their labors without... Um, fair compensation and all of that sort of touched on I think in this book um, the reason that we, that we that we talk about these big important things through a sort of entertaining fictional way is uh, because of, of a word that I want you to remember for your entire education and beyond hedonic weight um, I just mentioned the word hedonism um, if you think of hedonism hedonic about uh, of or pertaining to um, entertainment or pleasure, um, that when you can craft something to be powerfully um, uh, effective for someone, craft a um, narrative, a story, a movie that uh, is is entertaining, um, it and may yet give it a gravity, give it an importance. That's hedonic weight. That's um, reaching someone on an important thing through the language and tools of, um, of pleasure and enjoyment. And the reason that's important is because that's what we really respond to on, a, on an animalistic level. We really respond to those things. So if you can use that language 
um, it better connects. I mean, this is why, you know, a really dry textbook does nothing for you. This is why a really boring class does nothing for you. But if you have the teacher be entertaining, um, be full of passion, uh, be, um, tell funny stories, um, or like mildly compelling dad jokes, um, you can start to make better connections with the material. It's because of hedonic weight. Now, as artists, as designers, as storytellers, which all of you are, you need to remember that, that there's really something to be said for um, connecting through, through that language. Um, it's, uh, it's something noble, and it's something more powerful than just nonfiction. And when you read just nonfiction, um, you miss out on that. And that's why fiction can sometimes be better than true, better than real life, because you can arrange everything like a, like a chess set to, to show multiple layers of an experience or a truth um, in a powerful, communicative way that just doesn't happen in real life. Um, or if it does happen in real life, it's, it has to be fictionalized in order to make it compact enough to give it that punch, to, to give it that moment with the reader. Um, so anyway, that's just sort of my, my final thoughts about, about why this book is so, so powerful and so important. And uh, that resonates, I think, with so many other works. Um, anyway, maybe you've watched this now. Um, I look forward to our next book. I think you're going to love it. <laughs>